Hey everyone, Doug Miller. I'm a director at the Clean Energy Buyers Institute and also a co-founder of the Web3 clean tech startup Zero Labs. Um, so I'm going to start today by essentially going to a couple of things about one, why clean energy markets matter, how they work, um, where they're going, and then pivot to what's the role of digital solutions, including Web3. And so we have an exciting panel where my goal for today is really to paint a picture of how these markets work. And then uh, have the, the three panelists uh, who are here, Killian, Kirstein, and Jason, go into their role within this broader picture that I'll try to paint today for you all. Um, so just, just to start, I'll, I'll provide about five minutes of context before going into the panel discussion. Um, point one is, why do clean energy markets matter? So when you're thinking about the different sources of greenhouse gas emissions that, are, that we're polluting into the atmosphere, the general way of thinking about it is that there are three scopes of carbon emissions. One, there's scope one emissions, which are, are you polluting on site? Do you have a smokestack sending pollutants into the air? Scope two is your electricity use. What, what, is the, what are the carbon emissions associated with your electricity consumption? Scope three is everything else. It's a huge umbrella term, meaning everything from your supply chains to how your, your employees get to work um, to how, flying to conferences and so on and so forth. And so to set the context for today, we're focusing on scope two and the electricity slice of scope three, because if you think about it, your suppliers and your customers are also using electricity associated with your organization's um, products. And so um, now why do, why do clean energy markets matter? So if we know our grids are not green enough, they're still polluting too much carbon into the atmosphere, what we have is an inputs problem. We have, the, we have polluting resources sending electricity to the grid. And so the goal of, the, of clean energy markets is let's get as much clean energy onto the grid as possible and power down the polluting resources. And so about 10 or 15 years ago, clean energy, energy markets started forming where the whole concept was our policymakers are failing us. We're not moving fast enough. So the private sector came in and said, okay, how do we take our voluntary buying power as energy customers and, and get more investment in clean energy? And so you might see how lots of companies around the world are setting 100% clean energy goals, meaning they're buying clean energy 100% matching their annual cons electricity consumption. What that does is on one end, it actually provides direct revenues to solar, wind, hydro, geothermal facilities, and, and so on. Because this is, there's this thing called a renewable energy certificate where a renewable, or in other countries, they're called international RECs or guarantees of origin in Europe, where these instruments essentially provide additional revenue to a clean energy sale. Meaning, if you're a solar producer, you sell electricity to the grid, you get paid for that. You also can sell these RECs on top of that. And that becomes critical revenue. One, so you can grow your business. Two, you can get better capital and helps you, and helps you re, uh, reduce your investment risk. And um, so a, a quick uh, status check on this market. The past year or so, there's over 1.2 billion renewable energy certificates sold. So that means over 1.2 billion megawatt hours of clean electricity that's being transacted in markets globally. So it's big. It's not big enough yet though. So one of the goals of these markets, how do we get more buyers in? How do we grow demand to get more revenue and reduce investments, investment risks risk in clean energy? And the monetary value of this is, has surpassed 10 billion and folks expect it's gonna keep growing year on year. And why this matters is it means we get more investment in clean energy faster. Case in point, the past, uh, since 2014, major corporate clean energy buyers in the United States have supported the deployment of over 60 uh, gigawatts of clean energy capacity to the grid. In other words, companies have helped add a tremendous amount of wind and solar and storage to the U.S. grid, just as one example. So this is kind of why, why these markets matter. Now, um, you know, where are they going? So uh, if, you take a, if you take a pulse check of the progress we've made, yes, we've gotten a whole bunch more wind and solar and other resources onto the grid, but we're starting to reach a point where in some places, sometimes the day are relatively carbon free, but it turns out then there are certain times of day or certain periods of the year where it's still, it's still, it's still too dirty. It's still too carbon intensive. And so there's this general movement around how do we actually deploy clean energy in a more almost like pinpoint or with a dart way to get those times locations that are not yet carbon free enough. And so, um, the initiative I oversee at the Clean Energy Buyers Institute, it's called the Next Generation Carbon Free Initiative. What we've looked at is putting ourselves in the shoes of customers and in the shoes of all the stakeholders who are overseeing these markets. Where do these markets need to go? And last year, we identified a handful of things that, that companies really care about and they, and the in terms of new 
uh, clean energy products they want to buy, where some of those include buying clean energy when the grid is most carbon intensive or in the locations that are most carbon intensive, buying clean energy, matching their, their hourly electricity usage, this idea of 24-7 procurement. It's buying clean energy, covering their value chains, meaning buying clean energy or helping your suppliers buy clean energy so you can reduce your upstream scope three emissions or helping customers, your, your own users or customers downstream reduce their emissions by uh, buying clean energy on their behalf or helping them buy clean energy. Some of the others include how do we deploy investments in storage so that when it's windy at night, when we're all asleep, we can have that ready in the morning when we're turning on our coffee machines. Um, and there's other efforts too around how do we better tap into the private sector to engage policymakers to push the needle with driving better, you know, say permitting reform or um, you know, making uh, addressing the backlog of all the clean energy projects in the pipeline. How do we create incentives for that? And so where we think the market needs to go, and I'm start to pivot to the, the panel discussion in a second, um, there's a couple of evolutions we know need to happen in the market to bring forward solutions that do these types of things. Uh, and there are four main types of evolutions we need. One is we need on these instruments, the renewable energy certificate, which is the tradable instrument in this sector. We know we need more data fields. We need more attributes to provide more dimensions to the, the products. In other words, how do we make it so you can actually discover a uh, renewable energy that, that is deployed at a certain time or is deployed at a more carbon intensive location or time? Um, how do you capture certain social and community credentials on these certificates? So that's one area of evolution that a lot of folks like Killian are working on. And so I'll have him talk about that in a bit. Another area is we need better data to actually fill in those new attributes that we want to capture. Three, we need new incentive programs or leadership programs. Right now, all the, the only incentive companies have or the main goal post they have is setting a 100% clean energy goal where it's kind of very broad. And so how do we create incentives for these more targeted strategies and getting those times of, and locations that are still not carbon free? And the last area is how do we improve carbon accounting? How do we add other dimensions where we, we, we provide a reflection and incentive for companies to buy clean energy so that we get this revenue into the system and drive investments, but we also better reflect those who are actually pinpointing these times and locations that, that need more clean energy investment. And just to close, um, in terms of thinking about the, all of you and the work you're doing and the role, what's the role of digital technologies in Web3, I see that the two sides of the Web3 coin. On one side is the Web3 web sector uses a lot of electricity just like every other sector. And there's a big opportunity for this sector uh, to actually start buying clean energy in mass. And uh, you know, for example, this past year, uh, Filecoin Green and Protocol Labs have been helping to deploy this for the uh, Filecoin network in partnership with Zero Labs. That's a really exciting example of making this happen in the sector. Um, this is the role of things like the Crypto Climate Accord, which I launched. Um, and this will also be part of the content of one of the workshop sessions later today. The second dimension or second uh, side of the coin is there's a role of these of Web3 technologies in actually supporting digital solutions to make transactions easier and faster, the verification and carbon accounting easier. And so that's also part of the workshop later today, which is after lunch. Um, so now to open up to the panel discussion, um, we, have, we have some of the leaders in this space. Um, and as I kind of see, just to tee it up, I'm going to ask each of you um, essentially about how do you see your role in this sector, where the way I think what would be helpful for the group is if there are all these things, if there are these next generation goals that companies have. As I kind of see it, you know, Jason, for you, you're looking at buying clean energy the most carbon intensive times and locations, like thinking about the carbon dimension of procurement versus Killian, you're thinking about the hourly angle. We know we need hourly data so that companies can achieve a 24 seven goal. So we can actually deploy storage solutions so that we can actually make sure clean hydrogen is doing what it's supposed to do um, with you know all the investments we're deploying. And then for Kirstine, you know, you're looking at kind of the Wild West, which is scope three. How do we look at your crypto holdings and buying clean energy on behalf of the holdings and the transactions which are outside of your control? So with that, uh, Jason, just lo love to hear more, you know, introduce yourself, the work you're doing, but you know, this role of the uh, carbon impact in procurement, and then I'll open it up to Kirstine and Killian from um, Scotland and uh, Brussels, where have to call it Kirstine. She made it halfway here and her plane turned her around. So I was happy she could join us at least in this form. So made it home about what, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> I literally got out my front door 20 minutes ago. So I'm delighted to be here even virtually. And so I'm glad you didn't get stranded in Iceland for another day. Um, but Jason, do you want to start? Then I'll open it up to Kirstine and Killian. Uh, thanks for the introduction. 
Uh, happy to be here, really pleased and excited to be on the panels today. So my work in Minnesota is to build solar. I'm a, I was an installer for a little bit, now I'm a developer with a local construction company, electrical contractor. So we take projects from initial point of contact, design to commission system on grid. Uh, that's been my work for a little while. And in the last year or so, I worked with Filecoin Green team and uh, Killian as well at Energy Take. The project was that uh, to take the data from those systems, a customer owned system, and bring it online in a formatted, market ready uh, approach. And, you know, it was addressing what I saw as a barrier to the system. So, where I really connected to the topics that Doug's bringing up here is layering in uh, emissions avoidance data, for example, into the energy. So we can get a clear sense of how many pounds of CO2 were avoided because they consume solar today at this time in this place based on an insight from local grid fuel mix. Uh, because solar in one part of the country may be more impactful at a certain time of day than solar elsewhere in the world uh, based on what kind of grid fuels are being used. You don't want to necessarily put a bunch of solar in where it's already wind powered or there's already a bunch of solar on the grid because that's not necessarily improving our emissions state. But uh, so that tying of energy to emissions with some of these time and location based factors is, is a very curious part of directing growth that way. Thanks so much. Um, maybe Killian, let's go to you next to maybe bring in the dimension of hourly accounting and data, the work you're doing to make sure that we have the right types of recs and geos and irecs available out there. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks a million, Doug, uh, and everyone for, for having me along. Um, so yeah, basically, yeah, at Energy Type, we develop a, a global standard, an industry standard for hourly recs. So timestamp recs is the key piece of information that we, we think should be added to these renewable energy action certificates is to make sure that consumers can know the time at which their energy is produced. Uh, because this will create, obviously, um, new forms of incentives that are not necessarily always there in today's markets, particularly around flexibility and storage, uh, so that we, you know, uh, do the whole job that needs to be done to decarbonize the grid. Um, in terms of, you know, that hourly matching dimension, kind of how, how power, work, uh, power markets work anyway today, right? Like uh, all power markets have to match electricity on, on, a, on an hourly or sub hourly basis. And so should clean energy markets. Um, and that's that's kind of one of the guiding uh, lines of, of our vision is to make sure that ultimately we can have these clean energy markets that get to that end goal of every hour of the year matching clean supply with demand. Um, and that's what we need to get the carbonized grids. Uh, one you know, interesting example you touched on uh, already, uh, Doug, that I think has drawn a lot of attention for these, let's say, next generation carbon accounting methodologies um, is uh, clean hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is obviously a very electro intensive product um, and it's only clean if the electricity is clean. Um, if the electricity is dirty, then it's just dirty hydrogen. So it's really important to think about, you know, really robust rules, especially uh, as Europe and the United States and other countries around the world are, are going to put a lot of subsidies into, into hydrogen production. Um, and, mm -hmm. and like research from the likes of Princeton has shown that, yeah, uh, probably the best method for ensuring the housing is clean is, is hourly matching with local new supply. Um, so that's a topic we, we work on quite a bit at editor tag as well, to kind of raise awareness and drive guidance in the right direction there, um, from regulators. Thanks, Killian. Um, Kirsty, I'd love to hear more about how Zumo is thinking about scope three, uh, which we, I think, all know is kind of the wild west of uh, clean energy procurement. I think scope three is the wild west of everything. And actually within uh, the, the blockchain and digital asset space, it is perhaps a bit easier than in most other sectors because we have one data source or, you know, just a few data sources. And um, it is relatively easy to measure, albeit with big assumptions and caveats around it. So just by way of introduction, I work for a company called Zumo. We're a blockchain technology company based in the UK. And we've got a consumer crypto app and we also have an enterprise side to the business too. So we work with bank, fintechs, asset managers, et cetera, who are getting into the crypto space. And we have been looking at uh, decarbonization for uh, a number of years. Renewable energy procurement is a big part of that for us because primarily the cryptocurrencies that we deal with are uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, Ethereum, as we know, moved to proof of stake recently. 
and isn't such a big electricity consumer now, but Bitcoin still is. So we've been doing a lot of work on the apportionment of that. So how do you measure the electricity consumption? How do you apportion it fairly to um, individuals within the, the ecosystem? But more importantly, for the, the subject of this panel, how do you impactfully procure renewable electricity to account for the electricity uh, which is uh, apportioned to you in those calculations? So we deal really only at the moment in scope three emissions, whether that be Zumo's own accountability for the cryptocurrencies and blockchains that we work with, or whether that be our client um, crypto holdings. And so we're doing a lot of work at the moment on how we uh, devise strategies around impactful procurement decisions. So we're dealing primarily with unbundled RECs because we're not the ultimate users of the electricity. We don't have oversight of, um, of the time matching, et cetera, for, for Bitcoin miners and obviously Bitcoin's fung fungible. So we're dealing with all Bitcoin in the system rather than that created by, by certain miners. Um, so we are on a really interesting journey at the moment as to how we do this in the most impactful way possible, but also how we do it um, in line with guidance where possible and where the guidance isn't where we need it to be yet how we put our own boundaries in place and our own kind of transparency to show exactly what we're doing and why. Thanks so much. So we're here in a room with lots of folks who are doing cutting edge work on a range of digital technologies here. The, the main focus is Web3, but of course, folks are looking more broadly. would love to hear just how all of you think about the opportunities in at the nexus of digital technology and clean energy. How is it helpful? What problems is it helping you solve? And I know for each of you, you're coming at this from a different lens. So just if anybody wants to go first, we can keep it this kind of open. Do you want to start? I don't mind jumping in. So one of the things that drives my world is building assets, right? So I work with customers, business owners, residents who want to put solar at their home. They want to maybe put storage or an EV charger. And a lot of that decision, because it has a you know sizable upfront cost, you know, you could finance it too, but there's a big choice there is how quickly will it return? Where's the value going to come through? So energy markets in terms of selling the actual electricity is, is a place of value over time, federal incentives, local incentives, and something that I'm really interested in into the future, and this is something that Energy Tag has done work on is with their granular certificate standard is how do you store energy and then deploy it later uh, in a way that I'm, I'm really excited about it to show emissions reduction. So, you know, if you could take and charge your car overnight or charge a battery overnight at a low carbon intensity time on the grid and then deploy it later in the day, will you get credit for taking a low emissions kilowatt hour and putting it on the grid during a dirtier time? And, you know, is there going to be policy in place to reward that? Is there going to be a premium placed on energy to support it? Um, you know, there's, there's a whole trend in the AI as well that'll help with decision-making to make that more automated and effective. So, you know, a lot of things changing in the space that will help build more renewable and distributed generation assets. Thanks so much. Killian or Christine? Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, I think it's a really interesting point around storage. And um, so, yeah, we, we have done quite a bit of thinking about that uh, and, and definitely more more to be done um, as well. Um, because, you know, I think ultimately if these clean energy markets can't properly incentivize um, more build out of storage, then they haven't, you know, done everything they should be doing right like so we we do need to get this right and in europe at the moment we're actually considering a redesign of the electricity markets and it's actually a topic that is really coming up now it's how do we track storage so how do we provide incentives for storage uh, whether that be through short-term markets or long-term contracts like ppas and um, where the attributes the recs are tracked properly um, so this is going to pop up all over all over the world uh, and I think it's a really exciting time to be involved in this space as we set these standards now uh, and as Jason said to make sure that you know we can properly reward those who are shifting uh, clean energy uh, from times of abundance to times of scarcity uh, it's it's really one of the killer applications of, of, of these granular certificates or hourly recs um, uh, yeah really excited to work uh, work on on growing the volumes and deploying Christine? Um, and then I guess for, for my perspective, Doug, uh, because we are dealing primarily with, with Bitcoin um, and other cryptocurrencies, we are looking at procuring RECs 
in a situation where we're not exactly sure where the use of that electricity has been. And so how do we build out a way of doing that transparently and in a way that can be reproduced and that we can explain to others exactly what we're doing? So the approach we're taking at the moment is to work with the Cambridge uh, Bitcoin mining map to look at the geographical locations of Bitcoin mining and then procure recs kind of to represent those locations. Um, but there's obviously other ways of, of doing this too. And what we want to do is develop various rec purchasing strategies that reflect the most impactful buying decisions that we can have. So the next step is to look at emissionality and, and countries that perhaps have the dirtiest grids. And how can we, again, transparently with our clients, work towards uh, procuring recs in those areas? But I do think that with Bitcoin in particular, it provides both a challenge and an opportunity in terms of rec procurement. Because when you look at rec procurement in terms of supply chains or not RECs, but renewable electricity in general in terms of supply chains. You're generally talking about big multinational companies that are procuring on behalf of their suppliers who they know have relationships with, spend money with directly and can engage with. And we are not in that situation. So I think the big difference with the work that we are doing at Zumo in terms of renewable energy procurement and Bitcoin is that the Bitcoin miners don't know that we're procuring electricity on their behalf. We are doing it because we realize there's a gap in the data and we know we need to shift Bitcoin mining more to uh, renewables. So we are not doing this at the moment in, in partnership with our, I say, supply chain and inverted commas, the Bitcoin miners. Um, we are doing it to make sure that we are, are doing our bit as part of our own net zero strategy and can enable our clients and our app users to do the same which I do think is fundamentally different to renewable energy procurement in practically any other sector. So it comes with both its challenges and its opportunities for sure. That's real, oh, great points. Um, so I'm in, I'm in town from DC. So at the top of mind for me always is, even though I don't work directly in policy, is policy and regulation. Um, I think this year is going to be a big year on a number of fronts. We have the IRA being deployed. We have similar, in, the, the green industrial strategy out of the EU. Um, similar developments in other countries around the globe. We have forthcoming uh, requirements for public companies to disclose their carbon emissions from the Security and Exchange Commission. We have regional and state policies that are emerging. What's top of mind for you? What are you thinking about? What do you think folks in the room should should know about who maybe don't follow these all these um, regulatory conversations day to day? And anybody who wants to go first, please jump in. I'm happy to take that first, Doug. I think um, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people over the coming months and years how quickly regulation and policy is coming in that requires not only reporting of this, but reporting at a very high level. So I don't only work in the crypto space, I work in a number of other sectors too, and I do a lot of CDP reporting. And what we're beginning to see for companies, and, and sorry, I didn't explain what CDP is, but CDP is the global platform where companies, regions, cities can report on their carbon footprint. And it's extremely comprehensive. It isn't just asking for carbon footprint data. It's a very big, chunky report to do. And companies that previously had not been asked to report on that are now being asked by their supply chain to report. So I think from my perspective, we're going to get this from multiple angles in the digital asset space. I think we're getting it very heavily from uh, institutional investors. Um, and, and I think that there is no one source of uh, pressure that is coming our way. You know, there is a lot. And I, I think we're in a very interesting space because a lot of companies are not fully aware of what's coming down the tracks at them yet. So, so the pace of change is going to have to be very, very fast. Killing or Jason? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, policy really drives our market, you know, so the the federal tax credit was supposed to go down. It went back up to 30%, you know, from 22 to 30%. You know, like that's a lot for a bigger project. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a fantastic opportunity for rural small businesses, farmers, small businesses of all sorts. They can get a massive amount of money to build their projects. Uh, and that layers on top of whatever utility-based incentives or local incentives are there. And so these are very impactful um, to help get projects built. They really change the numbers. So I think, you know, those are really useful. The IRA also has a lot of broad support um, for economic justice adders and other impact zones and things like that. So you can see more equitable development happening in places where it might not otherwise take place. 
um, in, in the work that you're doing, Doug, to organize the voluntary market and the demand side of things, I mean, Zero Labs connected a massive amount of rec purchases last year. I just really want to say congratulations for that. But, you know, so taking the demand side, informing them, getting clear on the standards and the problem and the measurements that we're using to say that we were solving it, and then connecting it to suppliers, not just the typical utility scale actors, the, the big corporations, but starting to aggregate and reward the demand side of the market, the smaller people, the small businesses or individuals who can support that. I think that's, that's going to be an exciting part of the next couple of years is where we see that activate quickly. Killian, any fr anything uh, reporting from Brussels? <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> not. I think like it's almost a general thing that we're seeing now. I think we're at this kind of perhaps an inflection point um, in in clean energy markets and in actually what it what it even means to be clean, uh, what it means to consume clean electricity. That fundamental question. I think it it has meant something for the last let's say two decades um, with the initial phase of, of clean energy markets. It's driven a lot of wind and solar, uh, but now I think we're at a point where regulators in particular are looking to refine their definitions and to harp back again to hydrogen and um, because it's something we've worked a lot on and i think something that could actually you know to an extent single-handedly shape uh, the future of clean energy markets um, they are looking for more granular information and definitions of up clean energy you know in the same hour in the same grid these are the types of regulations we've seen being published in Europe, in the UK, that are being considered in the United States for the very large tax credit in the Inflation Reduction Act for hydrogen. And the US government obviously has a, you know, uh, 20, the 2021 uh, executive order uh, for 50% hourly matching of electricity um, by the federal government by 2030. So there's kind of this common approach to emerging um, and a kind of a new definition of what it means to be clean. And I think this probably will cascade across all sectors uh, and, and will become, you know, let's say the gold standard for, for any sector, whether that be um, uh, Bitcoin miners to steel production to, you know, uh, standard data centers. Uh, I fully expect that to, to over time and become, you know, the next generation type of definition. Uh, and I find, you know, I, I find that to be really exciting. Just to like, give an idea of the numbers for hydrogen in Europe, the, the targets will require approximately a France of electricity if they're to be met by 2030, hourly matched. The United States, it's about the same, right? The, it, it's uh, approximately 500 terawatt hours. Uh, this, you know, these are enormous, enormous volumes. And, you know, that's why I say could single-handedly kind of drag uh, the market in a certain direction. So yeah, we, we obviously find that super exciting and are really, you know, pretty pumped to be, to be part of developing these solutions. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, two more questions for the group or the, and I don't know if we'll have time for questions from the audience. Um, we will. Okay, cool. Um, so this next question is maybe we can keep these brief since we have about 10 minutes left total. What's keeping you up right now? What's, what's the biggest challenge you're facing, um, on any of the topics we've been talking about today? What's that one thing that's just like, ah, it's driving me, you know, if, if this thing was solved, we, you know, pick a point of magic wand at this, uh, that would be, that would be the, the thing that helps you move forward. I'd really be excited to see what is a fair and competitive and perhaps even generous valuation of a voluntary SREC. You know, what, what could we really expect to see funnel down to people to help them make that choice to move forward and how confident could they be in uh, set income for 10 years down the road based on their generation that that number as it gets more clear and easier to participate in will will really bring a lot of capacity online quickly i think i think for me doug it's the um i always struggle with myself in terms of finding the right balance between doing what we do well and always thinking, but it's not good enough. We need to be doing more because um, wherever we are all getting to in terms of our net zero targets and sustainability, it is not good enough. And we need to be thinking two years, three years, five years down the line in terms of how things will have evolved, 
how client needs will have evolved, how demand policy will have evolved. And so it's this not being able to sit still, reaching for what might seem like a position of comfort at the time and then thinking, okay, I've got to this point, now on to the next thing. And always maintaining that vision of what the future might look like and what the needs of the future are. And I think that's a skill we all need to continue to develop because that is only going to become more uh, more necessary. Uh, for me, you know, I think the, obviously we all have a common vision of fully decarbonized grids. Uh, and I think some of the definitions of how we need clean, clean energy markets to, to act are becoming clearer for, you know, as we've discussed already, perhaps through the, the, the hydrogen debates, um, for example. Um, so yeah, the thing that's really keeping me up at night now is, is let's get, you know, the mechanics in place. Um, and that, that is obviously emerging already, but we need the tooling, we need the plumbing, we need the infrastructure, uh, to get this done. Uh, otherwise we just have a vision and a design for the market and we, we don't have the implementation. Um. I think a, a really good example is one of our close partners, Embrets. Um, so it's a, a rec, a rec tracking system in, in, in the Midwest of the U S it's actually the biggest tracking platform in the world now in Minnesota. Doing <laughs> most of yeah. In Minnesota, exactly. Uh, all good things done for Minnesota. So yeah, they, uh, you know, have been, I think really at the forefront uh, of just showing, uh, with, you know, there is actually quite a small nonprofit and they already have, I think last, uh, last time I've heard 170 million, uh, already Rex is sitting in their system, ready, ready, ready to be traded, you know, and that's, that's really quite inspiring. Uh, and I think a great example for, for all rec registries around the world that like, you know, we can make this happen. Uh, uh and I hope that other registries can, can kind of go as quickly and show the same, uh, leadership. And we are seeing others, of course, you know, there's. The uh, IREC has been mentioned, Henry Binet, the uh, PGM in the US. There's, there's much movement now on the next generation of attributes, but I think that's, it's, it's super key. If we don't have the attributes, if we don't have the data, then the markets can't function. So that's, what's keeping me up at night, Doug. It's yeah. just really on, on blocking all of that. Right. Yeah. And making sure that everywhere in the world that we've the same situation as we do in the, in place like you, Jeff. Well, I can help but jump in. I mean, for me, the just to add to the conversation, it's making sure that we not only maintain in, incentives for the the private sector to engage in these markets, but expand those incentives and make sure the incentives drive toward where where we need the grids to go. Um, mm -hmm. There are there's concern that some of these incentives could be eliminated, so there's a lot of work to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, just to maybe wrap up the panel conversation piece, maybe in a word or two, when you're thinking about 2023. What's the thing you're tracking? What's the, the big thing you think's coming this year? Anything we have, you know, last comments that we haven't hit today? I think just building on what Last Killian was saying. Um, so I took, in the last year, I implemented a grant that I received from Filecoin Green to build like a data automation layer. And just the accessing these systems and partners and tracking registries and finding standardization is challenging. It's, it's hard. And then a lot of these partners out in the world, they have no idea what Web3 is. They don't know how it works. And they're developing um, institutional requirements for different reporting needs, for different things. And they're all kind of their own solution. And, you know, so I, I think a lot now about, like, what's going to be the common thread through it so that we can start showing labor hours and apprentice hours tied to projects, tied to generation. And, you know, Web3 has some tools for that, but they're not really well understood yet. So I think the systems themselves are going to have to transform and, and mature. Anything, Christine or Killian? I think for me, uh, what I would love to see in 2023 is more collaboration in our sector in terms of knowledge sharing, learning from each other, piggybacking on each other's successes, learning from each other's failures. Um, I've been involved in some of that over the last couple of years, various working groups, the WEF working group, we had the Global Digital Finance working group that also produced guidance in this area, but they haven't looked specifically at renewable energy or renewable energy procurement. And it's an area that I would really, really love to see more activity on. Um, if, you know, if there was other people that were interested in doing that, I would be very interested in talking to, talking to you about it. I, I, I have two things, maybe on both sides of the Atlantic. In the US, 45B, which is the name of the tax credit for hydrogen. Um, if that comes out as we hope, 
I think, you know, with, with our own batching involved, um, that's going to be an enormous driver of change uh, in the United States and an enormous help to produce truly clean hydrogen in the US, uh, which I think uh, is definitely the thing we're watching very closely for Treasury guidance, which is coming out in the next couple of months on that. In the EU, it's more around the guarantee of origin and the evolutions that uh, that are about to happen in that system uh, you know, through the renewable energy director in Europe. So that is going to be, well, it's been agreed and going to be published soon. And we expect movement there to enable more granular timestamp geos. Uh, looking forward to just having more and more of them available in Europe um, this year. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, maybe just to draw a couple of closing points and we'll open up for maybe, uh, maybe a time for a little bit of questions. Um, so, it, you know, just to take away on one end, clean energy markets are important. They're evolving. And in terms of the role of digital technologies, there's a couple of areas. One is how do we capture these new types of data? How do we make it easier for folks to better understand what they're buying and better communicate the evidence and verify um, that they did in fact buy the particular type of clean energy solution they thought they did to map toward helping the grid get greener. Um, and and so there's the transaction side, then there's also on the, um, or transaction side, then there's the underlying tracking, uh, tracking system side. So how do we, there are standard instruments out there. How do we get the data there? How do we, um, so, so you build on these existing systems and standards rather recreate the wheel in the energy sector. Um, and there's probably a lot of opportunities to, to find, you know, for financing projects and so on. Um, so I'll stop there and open up the floor. Any questions from the audience? I see two, so maybe we do both. And if we have time for a third one, you first. Um, thanks for the insights. Here is structure. You mentioned time staffing, uh, but like to what extent do you see this becoming a goal? Okay. So the, the first question was about, um, just the, the geographic nature of, uh, certificate markets. Is there an opportunity for global markets? And I'll answer that after the, what, what was your question? Uh, to take us like 10 years forward and uh, like what where do you see this all going like you know i know it's obviously i'm asking you to predict the future of it but like what is your real vision for how all of this works together and in, in a you know we have probably less than 10 years to really get a lot of this stuff pulled together and then make a significant impact so well and there was one last there's one other question and we only have two minutes to answer them so what was yours Something that it is not as well proceeded to me and generally screw that. Yep. Yep. The last question was about uh, the que the long queues and inter inter uh, connection reform, uh, and permitting reform. So, um, just the first question on the geographic one. I don't necessarily, there's essentially three markets there's the US market, the European market, and, and then the rest of world market, which is IREX. I don't necessarily see there being a convergence per se, but maybe over time there could be at least more transparency on the pricing of these instruments. Um, I think in part because the US recs are baked into so many individual states or regions laws and same for the EU. So I don't see that necessarily changing, but hopefully more transparency on a lot of fronts. Um, on the question of, and then I'll open up, the, the, you know, the maybe I'll answer this one first. I mean, it's a, it's, a ref, it's a policy question. There's a lot of work right now to improve permitting in the United States. Hopefully the permitting doesn't also allow for oil and gas exploration and so on. It's all, ideally it would only be for clean energy projects. Um, and then maybe open up to the group, my 10 year prediction or whatever it might be is, I hope that we can just deploy clean energy as fast as possible and focus on the other sectors. We figured out what we need. We know what we have to do in the energy sector. Let's get this done and move on to the next thing. And hopefully by 10 years from now, we have to have done that or else we're in trouble. Anything else that folks want to add from the panel? Well, I'll just say um, for global market, local market, you know, if you have a global company and you have operations in a certain area, you may want to put green energy into there or somewhere else where the emissions are dirty to manage your net global emissions score. So things like that will change, I think, around how projects are located. 
Um, money is in IRA to support infrastructure development, so that should help with some of those things, but utilities are very slow sometimes and drag their feet, so it's hard, but they do their best. Anything else, Killian or Christine? Sure. Um, yeah, just, just very quickly, I think uh, we should definitely strive to have more global standardization. I think that might just make it easier for everyone. Um, whether there's a global market, I think that would be up to consumer choice, whether consumers want to, you know, really focus uh, on local supply of clean energy or look to to offset um, their their local emissions uh, with energy from elsewhere. And the other, a uh, permanent huge issue, a huge, huge issue. Uh, everything that we're doing is not going to come to any good if projects don't get permanent and built. Uh, so in Europe as well, it's been, you know, uh, a major, major issue, and the EU has proposed like emergency legislation to speed up permitting. Um, Ten-year prediction. Well, uh, you know, I, I kind of reflecting or to echo what what Doug said. Like the a decarbonized grid, electricity grid is big, is the tool we need to decarbonize the global energy system at large, transport, industry, etc. So I just hope we're a very long way there in ten years. Otherwise, it's just going to be much harder to get everything else done. Final word, Kirsten. Just, just to come from that, and I, w I wouldn't uh, respond to all three, but the 10-year vision, honestly, this will be good housekeeping in 10 years. This will not be innovation in 10 years because electricity is one of the easier things to do. And there are plenty of sectors out there that we need to decarbonize and we don't yet have the technology to do. We do with renewables. And I know what we've been talking about today is the innovations in doing that. But fundamentally, we do know how to do this. In 10 years' time, it should literally just be good housekeeping that all um, companies that have 100% renewable electricity as standard, um, that, that that's implemented across grids too. Great point. A great way to close the conversation. Thanks so much. Yeah.